what are you eating then to to try to delay the aging process? Like what is, so diet obviously plays a very important role in aging and I'm trying to figure out exactly the best diet to eat and we can talk a little bit about what I've, what I mm -hmm. think, but I'd love to get some of your thoughts. So, I mean, I think the short answer is we don't know definitively and I don't think we're going to know definitively if you define definitively as a randomized clinical trial of longevity in humans. You know, we have to posit that we're never gonna figure that out. So instead we have to rely on proxies. So we, uh, we look at proxies in animals where you can do virtually anything you want in a totally controlled setting, but then you run the risk of two things. One, are you identifying diets that are clinically and biologically meaningful to your host? For example, if you put you know, a humanized diet into a mouse, what you learn may or may not extrapolate to the mouse, uh, extrapolate to the human. <laughs> Um, and then secondly, you're really hindered by the idea that you're studying that animal in an artificial environment. And when you reduce the risk of a subset of metabolic or a subset of death, a subset of, you know, causes of death, which is effectively metabolic disease, you're often unable to measure what in my opinion is an underappreciated, um, risk that comes on, which is sort of the more sudden and traumatic causes of death that we take for granted, especially in the case of caloric restriction. So that's the problem with animals. Then what we do in humans is we can rely on our best proxy biomarkers that we think reflect the systems that drive aging. And we can measure those things over time and sort of, you know, estimate what we think is the effect of, you know, this dietary change or that dietary change or this lifestyle change or that drug change on those things. And so um, I basically try to focus my efforts on those, on, on, on sort of converging those two worlds, um, but acknowledging that we're never going to know the answer for certain and we're going to have to use our best judgment around those things and, and hope that in time certain other things do become available. Um, for example, it would be really great if there was a way in the blood to measure the activity of mTOR. We don't have that. Um, it would also be great if we could you know, measure other growth pathways like the RAS pathway uh, without having to rely on you know, tissue biopsies and things like that. So um, just for people that don't know what mTOR is, can you explain why that's really important? Yeah, so there are, there are probably, um, depending on who you talk with, or would, I would say there are two or three major growth pathways in the body that are kind of responsible for growth, both in the positive sense and in the pathologic sense. The two that I focus on the most are the IGF pathway and the mTOR pathway. Now, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, I think for the sake of time, I will not tell my favorite story, which was is a, is a story that is both the discovery of rapamycin and uh, perhaps more interestingly, the elucidation of how it worked. But suffice it to say, the compound rapamycin was identified first, um, long before a really amazing guy named David Sabatini as a PhD student at Hopkins in 1993, 94, um, as a side project in a lab made the discovery that this thing, rapamycin, was actually working by inhibiting a protein complex of which TOR, target of rapamycin as it became named, was the central piece. We now know today that it can form into two complexes. One is called mTOR complex one or mTORC1 and the other is mTOR complex two, TORC2. Um, and we also know that it exists in different tissues and it has different activities in different tissues. And so like most things in the body, too much or too little is a bad thing. So if you have no mTORC1, for example, in your muscles, you'd wither away and that would be a debilitating condition. And in fact, for people with muscular dystrophy, one of the things you wanna do is figure out how to alter that pathway. But similarly, we know that over overactivity uh, is, is predisposing us to aging and of course, certain diseases of aging like cancer. So for uh, people that, you know, when, when Peter mentioned that you might, if you don't have any mTORC1 activity, you might, you know, ca cause muscle wasting. Well, that's because mTOR does play a very important role in protein synthesis. And uh, what's very interesting is that both the two pathways that you mentioned in being involved in aging, mTOR and IGF-1, uh, IGF-1 actually increases mTOR activity. So, you know, they're, they're yeah, in these a, aren't these aren't independent pathways. Right. Yeah. And what's also very interesting is that they're both uh, regulated by amino acid intake. Right. Yes. So IGF-1, one of the major. So IGF-1 is also a growth factor that um, you do need as well. So it's one of those things where you don't have any IGF-1. Yeah. Well, 
you know, you're, you're going to not, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, there's a lot of positive things about IGF-1, muscle growth, muscle repair, right. neuronal growth. But too much IGF-1 also can allow damaged cells to right. continue growing. Um, but are you familiar with like any of the uh, dietary nutritional research on IGF-1 and mTOR and specifically with amino acids and how? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of my biggest obsession, I think, is probably around those topics. So um, it's complicated. I think we have probably a better understanding of mTOR. I mean, I think it's very clear that mTOR is amino acid driven. Um, in fact, what's today? Last Thursday, eight days ago, David Sabatini and his group at MIT published a paper in Science um, that identified um, the amino acid sensor for mTOR1. Now, it's always been suspected what it was, which was leucine, was the highest uh, affinity. Um, but in fact, it was, he's now crystallized that structure. So um, if you even think about it through the lens of like, why do bodybuilders or people who you know, love lifting weights want to take branch chain amino acids while they're exercising? Uh, the reason is largely through this empirical observation that it enhances muscle growth uh, and or prevents muscle degradation during exercise. What I think is really interesting is that you know, we now know exactly what's going on. So the branch chain amino acids, there are three, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, it turns out that isoleucine and valine are virtually irrelevant. It's pretty much all leucine. Um, and what's really clever, just from an evolutionary perspective, is that mTOR in muscle has a much higher affinity for leucine than mTOR1 in fat or in hepatocytes. Now that's a good thing because you'd like to believe that in times of nutrient deprivation, even a trace amount of leucine should preferentially provide the muscle with its growth signal before providing the adipocyte or hepatocyte. So, so from a nutrient sensing pathway, what you could infer from that is too little leucine, probably a bad thing. Um, too much leucine, probably a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now what too much and too little are I think remains to be seen. Right. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, because one of the questions a friend of mine asked me recently, actually a mutual friend, Tim Ferriss, um, is, you know, can we, can we take too much leucine during a workout? Um, and again, I don't think we know the answer, but, you know, extrapolating from the animal data, I think five grams of leucine during a workout, probably not harmful. And it also doesn't stick around very long because when we take amino acids in a workout, if you sort of sip them throughout the workout, you're taking a free amino acid. So it's got a relatively short uh, stay in the body. In fact, one of the pharmaco interests on this front, which is to treat diseases of muscular wasting, is to actually come up with molecules that are not necessarily more potent agonists of the leucine receptor, but would stick around a lot longer. Because that's actually the problem with the nutrition side. Is we can't keep leucine around long enough to stimulate muscle growth. Okay, so that's the, that's the easy story. Right. Now the hard one. IGF. Yes. Okay. So two schools of thought on this. I am in one camp, um, but I will acknowledge the other camp. One camp says IGF-1 is driven exclusively by amino acids. Mm -hmm. um, the other camp says, no, it's actually driven by uh, amino acids and carbohydrates. Yes. And carbohydrates indirectly via insulin. Yes. So... Why are those mutually exclusive? I mean, oh, uh, the way I define it, when I'm, there are certain people who I will not name that are prominent in the field uh, who, who I will argue with that will argue that the carbohydrates play no role. It's virtually all protein. But there is a role that they do play. That's been shown. Depending, I believe it has been shown. But been shown. I, I, I mean, there are, there are wonderfully erudite people in this field who believe it is entirely an amino acid issue. Okay. Um, and it is true. Methionine has probably been shown to be the most active amino acid in driving IGF mm -hmm. uh, pathway. However, as it sounds like you agree, um, it's pretty clear that as insulin levels go down, yes. IGF BP3 goes up as IGF BP3, uh, sorry, IGF binding protein 3 goes up. Uh, maybe it's worth me taking yeah, a moment to explain why that, that matters. So most of these things, as maybe the listeners know, you know, when you have hormones floating around the body, whether it be testosterone, whether it be cortisol, whether it be, uh, you know, thyroxine, these things, they don't, because they're typically hydrophobic, they can't just travel through the bloodstream freely, they have to be bound and carried, just as cholesterol does. And so it's these binding proteins that we often don't think about that play a, an important role in determining how much active or bioavailable hormone is free. So in the case of IGF-1, it gets trafficked by this IGF binding protein, 
And most of these binding proteins actually bear an unbelievable relationship to insulin. So sex hormone binding globulin goes up when insulin goes down. It's very interesting. There's always this complaint that um, free testosterone levels will drop all things equal in someone who restricts carbohydrates. And um, I remember sort of hearing that empirically and not really thinking much about it until I started to, one, observe it, and two, understand why. And it's quite obvious because, again, all things equal, when insulin goes down, which is usually what happens when you restrict carbohydrates, sex hormone binding globulin goes up. That means if you have no change in testosterone level or even estradiol level, free testosterone will go down. Less testosterone is around to be unbound to the sex hormone binding globulin. So, um, so, so it's for that reason that I think that insulin and carbohydrate do play an important role in the IGF pathway. And I also think empirically, um, not that I like to refer to ecology or epidemiology, but when you look at the ecology and epidemiology of cancer, um, to my knowledge, the content of highly refined carbohydrate and sugar uh, is more predictive of cancer in a society than the, uh, the variety in protein content. In other words, there are cultures that have consumed larger and lesser amounts of protein that have been without mass uh, yeah. amounts of cancer, but the same cannot be said with large amounts of these things. Now, the problem by these things, I mean uh, sugars and high yeah. glycemic index are high. The problem with that is, of course, you can't infer a cause from that. But the negative to me is suggestive that at the very least, carbohydrate content matters when it comes to IGF-1 signaling. Absolutely. And the way I like to think about it, actually, when <clears throat> you're discussing these two things is, you know, IGF-1 is not a cancer initiator. Like, it's not going to cause the initial damage that can make a normal cell aberrant, a normal cell that acquires whatever problems it acquired to make it you know, turn into a right. cell that's not cancer. What IGF-1 is really good at doing is taking that cell that's it's already acquired the damage. Yeah. Right, and saying, here, keep growing. Like, no, don't die. I know there's signals in your body that are trying to kill right, you, right. but don't die. You know, whereas the, the refined carbohydrates, the way I always think about it is, you know, that leads to a variety, a plethora of physiological processes in your body, inflammatory processes, you know, a lot of different... Um, pathways that are causing damage, that are initiating the type of damage. So it's like, well, if you have someone that's eating a terrible diet, they're eating refined carbohydrates, they're, you know, they're releasing endotoxin in their gut, they've got this constant inflammatory process going on, they're releasing hypochlorite damage, you know, they're damaging mitochondria, damaging DNA, blah, blah, blah. Well, and then, you know, they've, so they've acquired all these damaged cells, and then they're eating, you know, a bunch of protein and activating the IGF-1 pathway. It's like dynamite. It's like, here, here's the damaged cell, and here's the, the signals to, to like, keep, keep living and keep growing. So I kind of... Yeah, I mean, I, I think, so you obviously alluded to this, and I think many patients, when I talk to them, um, are sort of surprised to learn that every one of us has cancer. I mean, at this moment, I have millions of cancer cells in my body, as do you. The, the, the good thing is virtually all of the time the problem gets eradicated, right? So either we talk about the apoptotic pathways that you described, but even when those pathways fail, our immune system is remarkable. Um, I did my postdoc in immunotherapy, so I yeah. spent about two and a half years working uh, with T-cells, um, specifically regulatory T-cells and looking at this problem. And, you know, we just take for granted how good the humoral uh, the, the cellular immune system is rather. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for those again, maybe not familiar with immunology, you know, you have your B cell system, your T cell system. These T cells, which are the ones that fight viruses, are unbelievable. Um, when you think about how many antibiotics we have in our arsenal to fight bacterial infections, it's remarkable. Think about how many antiviral drugs we have relative to antibiotics. We have very few, and we certainly don't have them for the most common viruses we acquire. And yet, virtually all of us recover in the end unharmed from the typical viral infection we get two to three times a year. That's a testament to how amazing our immune system is. And when you unleash it against cancer, it's effective 99.9% .9 of the time. So yeah, the name of the game is avoid the amplifiers. Now, the other reason why I think this is an important thing, an important concept that goes beyond cancer, but now gets to the broader aspect of aging is, um, when you look at the people who live the longest, when you look at these people who live to 100 and beyond, for the most part, they die of the exact same diseases as the rest of us schleps. They just get them later. 
that's really important because I think it offers an insight into longevity that is um, often overlooked. So if the people who live to 100, 105 were all dying in car accidents and plane crashes, you might make the argument that there's two classes of citizens, right? There's the people who get chronic disease, and then there's people who will never, ever, ever get it, and eventually they just die of something else. Because remember, the fourth leading cause of death or the fifth leading cause of death starts to become accidental stuff once you get outside of the chronic stuff. But that's not the case. The point is we're all sort of pre-programmed to go through this process. But if you want to live longer, the name of the game is delaying the onset of the big three. Mm -hmm. The big three being the diseases that will kill 75% of us. So cerebrovascular and cardiovascular, cancer and neurodegenerative. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so that brings us back to why we don't, well, why we've got to have IGF and mTOR in check, because right. we've got to prevent them from being able to sort of amplify that. 